I'm Steven Zapata, and clearly, this is not a video about symbols. What are you doing here again? <laughs> Why are you subscribed? Uh, I have no videos. <laughs> I mean, it's awesome. It's just a little baffling. I'm glad you guys are here. So yeah, I'm working on the scripts for our first forays into themes and symbols and art. But while I work on those, I wanted to get some general information out there on my thoughts about drawing. This channel will always have a lot of drawing happening on it, but I'll often be discussing things like about the drawing, not how the drawing is made. So this video will hopefully give a baseline explanation of what I'm thinking while drawing, and I can point people to this in the future. I should also say that the drawing in this video is unrelated to the content of the audio. It's just a typical demonstration of how I work and shows how I get from point A to point B. So, what is drawing? Well, I think we all have an implicit personal sense of what is or isn't a drawing when you compare it to a painting or a sculpture, but those definitions are so fluid that I think it's better to start at the very foundations of this whole weird thing. Unfortunately, that means I need to grapple with the classic, what is art, question. <laughs> so drawing is an art practice, and an art practice is like many other creative practices. Divorced from whatever its final outcome is, a creative process involves abstract goal setting, repetition, training, and learning, and lastly, execution. The last part is pretty broad, and it should be. If you look at those steps on their own, you'll see they could apply to things that aren't usually considered creative. You could set the abstract goal of running a marathon, experiment creatively with training yourself up to being capable of doing it, then the execution would be race day. Am I saying that I think a marathon runner is engaging a creative practice? That they are an artist? Sure. Yeah, I am. And if you don't like that, well, you're, you're probably not gonna like a lot of this, so just quit now. Honestly, if a plumber came up to me and told me he experiences his work as art and that he believes himself to be an artist with pipes, I wouldn't doubt him for a second. In fact, I'd tell him he's more of an artist than half the people I know, half the people I see drawing. He's also probably making more money off his art than 95% of the artists out there. But how can I possibly be this open with my definition of art? That's because there really is no such thing as art. There are only artists. That's a quote from E.H. Gombrich's The Story of Art. I remember picking that book up in a store years ago and getting completely stuck on that first line. To me, it seemed like such a foundational truth that it had to be the most important thing in the book. So, so I closed the book, and I haven't read much of the book since, a little bit. I think of that opening line often, maybe every day. I mean, is it possibly debatable? Good luck debating art in the first place. If you ask 100 artists, actually, forget that, if you ask even 100 illustrators to define what art is, you wouldn't get the same answer twice. Need you any more proof that the idea of art is less than dust? The people who do it can't agree on an explanation yet they move through that realm effortlessly. To me, the answer to this paradox is clear. The art and its definitions mean nothing, implicit in the fact that none can be given that is totally true for more than one artist. Art is better understood as the actions of a complete person, as a practice that is part of their life and culture and supported by it. When looked at in these terms, the varying processes, goals, meanings, and methods of every individual's art process aren't a surprise, but clearly essential to what it means to make work. Some will hear that and think I am invalidating their love for particular pieces of art. I'm not. I'm just being very specific about where I draw the line on that. It's your love for this particular piece of art. And that's it. The art itself does not have some mystic soul that is entangling you and forever marrying your thoughts to it. It's all coming from you. Your love for anyone else's art is just an aspect of your life. 
and so a part of your practice. It's you manufacturing the meaning and love for the piece. And it's almost guaranteed that the deep meaning you get from it was not the artist's intention, or different from what they were going for. And, just like music, your favorite piece of art may be someone else's existential garbage that makes them doubt the entirety of the human endeavor. Is that grounds for conflict? No. Does it mean you're stupid and have bad taste? No. It just means that you have a taste. And evaluations of whether it's good or bad are pure dinner party talk. So what, Steven? It's all fucking whatever, and there's no rules, and shit on the sidewalk is art if someone shit it there as art, and there's no purchase on this rain slick cliff and no one can help me? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that fun? Let me be completely serious here. Why do you need someone to tell you what you're doing? It's because you don't think, that is to say, you don't feel that you know what you're doing. And you think that's bad, but it's not. The state of realizing that you don't know what you're doing is actually a very clear understanding of a vague condition that you are in. I know that sounds like some useless loop, but it is the true nature of what's going on. So if you associate vagueness or not understanding with negativity, there is no true vagueness to find. It's understood quite clearly that you do not understand. So just throw out the label. Why label it negative? You're not an architect. Nothing you make, no matter how unskillfully, is going to get anyone killed. It's just going to be. And once it's out there, it's not up to you whether people like it or not. In fact, once you've put enough work out there, you'll realize people gravitate to the things you least expect. You'll often have things you think are your best go utterly unnoticed. And things you thought were absent-minded driveling to be completely magnetic to audiences. You have no say over any of this. Because it's up to each individual to experience your art in their own subjective universe. Okay, we can talk about the philosophy of art making all day, all year. But where does drawing fit into this? Well... Seeing as how I just tore down the foundational boundaries that keep plumbers from painters, it should be pretty clear that, to me, drawing is a laughably broad concept that can invade a life at a moment's notice. I think people are drawing when they rearrange their furniture. I feel like I'm drawing while speaking this. I'm creating rhythms, designing points of emphasis, doing broad strokes, adding little details, and most importantly... I am orchestrating contrast, just with my voice. It's all one practice. Now this first principles interpretation of drawing is where I personally prefer to stay. But for this video, I would like to take a rare sojourn into brass tax practicality. So here is how I like to draw. I'm gonna keep it simple because it is simple. I prefer a monochromatic, tonal, and linear approach, mostly achieved with a graphite pencil. I like a good eraser so I can correct, carve, push, and pull, and create effects. Various tools provide shortcuts for tonal areas, stumps for smudging, powder pastels for covering large areas relatively flatly, and the paper varies. Thin, thick, expensive, cheap. It's all good. I use just about every brand and type. I base paper choice on how long the drawing will be worked on, as thick paper holds up to abuse, and thin paper has nice, fast little effects but falls apart with much rework. Now for some artist-facing explanations of how I draw. These will be pretty obscure to anyone who is not already researching drawing on their own, so I will briefly list them. My preference for my personal work is to draw mostly from imagination. I use references whenever there is an obvious, helpful one I can think of, but I rarely go hunting for references. I work constructively. My initial stabs at a drawing are meant to delineate the forms in this illusory space and establish their volumes and intersections. I think this is very common for anyone who works from imagination, as there is no reference to translate as a series of 2D shapes. I use hatching in my drawings, but not always traditional cross-hatching. I keep my hatching tight and generally in one direction and build my value so that the transitions are emphasized and not the energy of the hatching itself. Usually. Most of my more developed drawings have parts that fall on either side of that fence. But I would say that to me this is still cross-hatching. There is no way I'm hitting the exact same angle with every hatch, so they must be hatching. Just angles so close together that it's basically invisible and instead stitches a rather seamless value. When rendering from imagination, I almost always put my forms under a single hard light. I just have the most experience with this, have practiced it from reference the most, and find it gives me the most bang for my buck. 
It's also great training because a single hard light demands the highest level of understanding what's really happening with your forms in relation to the laws of light. Secondary sources or diffuse lighting obscure and sometimes simplify many of these things, and if done exclusively, will never train you to handle a hard light from imagination, where a hard light will train you to handle a diffuse one. The trade-offs are that diffuse lighting is generally more inviting and appealing in a broad sense, and that the clarity that comes with a hard, strong light source can make it hard to make things feel mysterious. Every other aspect of my drawing and the way that I draw really deals with specifics. The way I use anatomy, the nature of my designs, the particular way I render, these are just my versions of classic realms of study. And if you want to learn more about those, I recommend you pursue teachers who specialize in those specific areas. Now, if you thought all that stuff earlier got a little meta, you're in for a treat. Let's close with a little bit about the why. Why is drawing? I'm afraid, as with so many things, the what still doesn't cover the ground floor of drawing. Why is it? Why is it? That shit drives me crazy. Why can we make illusions on paper? Why can we make illusions in any way? Why does our mind let itself get tricked? Why can dust and powder, carefully nudged and applied to a surface, rather quickly trigger your brain to recognize an arm or a face or, and, and this is truly odd, something that it's never seen before. Why should it be able to do that? How terribly unlikely. Why doesn't it all just fall apart and float away or not do anything? I mean, if you show your dog a drawing, it doesn't think anything of it. Even if you rub your scent on it. Even though they see in a very similar way to us. We, for some reason, are hopelessly entranced by drawings and images. Abstractions, you might say. There is never a chance to resist them or deny them. You look, and so you see, completely without effort or choice. And once you glance, your brain begins its favorite little task of decoding all the patterns and producing a mind state that cannot unsee the pattern it has found. Stranger than that, <laughs> stranger than that, if you look at an abstract and your brain offers the pattern of no pattern, nothing recognizable here, you'll have trouble unseeing that damn thing that isn't anything. If a friend popped up behind your shoulder and revealed there was something concrete hidden in this abstract image after you'd set your mind, you would strain and contort as your mind tries to pass through the doors it has already closed and return to the neutral state that does allow for a pattern in this place. If you have ever struggled to see the illusion in a magic eye stereogram image while a friend is imploring you to just relax your eyes, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. All of this is to say, to me it is very clear when you are drawing, you are engaged in a very deep mind game. So don't worry so much about what's happening on the paper. What's happening in your mind is always much more interesting. And your drawing is always a symbol of that mind state. Whoops, didn't I say this video wasn't about symbols? I guess I lied. If you have any questions about this video or anything else, leave them in the comments or email me at stevensketches at gmail.com. I'll answer all your questions in a Q&A follow-up to this video. Thanks for listening.